and thanks to all of you for joining me today for what I regard to be the most critical area of reading development right now for many, many students um, in the U.S. and in other English-speaking countries. As we start, I always like to bring in the reason why we're here today. So these are basically our clients. These are the people for whom I work. I typically call the, the kids who are really focusing on today the students who depend on public schools to become highly literate. And I'm going to talk about what percentage of the American population this is. But as we start, I want you to take a look at that one student on the left. And in case you didn't see her, here she is highlighted. And my hope is that that's not how you look at the end of this presentation. So I want to spend a little time just setting up why it is that we're here today. Um, we often hear about the state of American reading education through the findings of the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And these are the data from the most recent uh, reading assessment. And what this indicates is that we have approximately a third of our population who is achieving the levels that we want kids to be reading at. And then we have another third that we regard to be at basic level, and then another third below basic level. Frequently when especially politicians and policymakers talk about these data, they talk as if the students in the below basic and the basic groups aren't really reading. And I want to disabuse people of that idea today. But what I'm really saying is we need a better idea of what it is they can do. So this is what a typical passage looks like on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This is a typical fourth grade passage. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today um, talking about what the differentiation is between the, um, the yellow and the purple words. But suffice it to say that the yellow words are words that are fairly frequent in written English. In fact, these words occur at least 10 or more times per million. And in any text, and this is a fourth grade text, we expect there to be three to four purple words per hundred. Okay, in this case, it's a 900-word text, and we actually have fewer purple words. So what we're actually seeing here is that this is a little bit easier than most fourth grade texts. Okay, and we just saw some of the data in the previous slide as to how students are doing. Now, we have to also keep remembering that many of the responses that students are asked to give on the national assessment are actually open-ended written ones. But I'm coming back to this question of what is it that students are and aren't doing? One of the things I want you to remember from this particular slide is the number of words that students are being asked to read. So on the National Assessment, you actually have to read that whole passage, and then you're asked to answer questions. Well, one of the things that we know about students reading is that on oral reading fluency assessments like the Dibbles, one of the things that they do for us is they give us large bodies of information about kids. So this is based on thousands and thousands of stu students' performances. And what we know is that by the end of grade one, now keep remembering, short amount of reading, right? About a minute on a typical oral reading fluency passage. But what you're seeing here on the left-hand side is that in terms of word recognition, I'm only showing you the bottom 50%. Because remember, the kids that we're really concerned with, the kids who depend on schools in the below basic, basic, I mean, we could have gone up to about 65%, but I've stayed with the bottom 50%. What you're seeing here is that by the end of grade three, the students at the 50th percentile are almost 100% accurate on this oral reading. 
And I really want to underscore that the particular data that we're looking at, dibbles, actually is a function of grade level passages. They're actually, and we've documented some of that in, in some studies. But what you're seeing here is that most of the kids, even the 25th percentile, even the 10th percentile, have hit that level of 90% accuracy that people like Mari Clay, the reading recovery developer, and Steve Stahl, another um, literacy researcher, have said is pretty much what, it, what is needed if you're going to comprehend text. But what you're seeing on the right-hand side is that students' comprehension is very, very poor after they've read this passage. Another piece of evidence is some data that recently came out about how kids are comprehending while they're reading silently. And this is a comparison of the same text in 1960 and kids in 2011. Um, so two different cohorts of kids 50 years apart. And what we're seeing here is that we've actually seen, especially in middle school, we've actually seen a plateauing in terms of students' reading rates. Now, before I go any further, please don't misunderstand today. I'm not going to be talking about increasing reading rates in the same kinds of ways that we've often talked about increasing oral reading fluency. <clears throat> what I'm talking about is how you comprehend while you're reading silently. And what I'm going to actually show you today is a measure that our colleagues at um, Ames Webb Pearson have developed. And I want you to know that in no way am I involved in the development of this measure. I've been such an enthusiast about it, hence they asked me to talk about it. So I don't get royalties on this. I don't get anything based on the silent reading fluency with comprehension measure. But I want to show you an inventive way that's now accessible to understand how our kids are reading silently with comprehension. Okay? So this measure, as I've said, I think it's very inventive and very theoretically sound and gives a very clear idea of how kids are reading. So this is at the fourth grade level. So what happens is a, ki a, a student reads a panel, okay, and then press next when it's time to, to go ahead, there's actually a control on how quickly they can go. So they can't move so fast, uh, you know, crazy reading fast. They then answer a question. And these questions are just to see if you're keeping up in the process of reading. Okay? So they aren't um, life existential kinds of questions. What we're kind of getting here is a monitor on how you're continuously reading. Now, the interesting thing here is that you actually get told whether you got the answer right or wrong. And this is an, <clears throat> excuse me, an important element because we're trying to get kids to attend. And as you're going to see in just a minute, that seems to be one of the issues many kids have. Okay, you read the next chunk, you answer the next question, and once more, you're told how you did. And at the end of the passage, uh, the end of the, in all the segments, so there are four segments for every one of these passages, you're told how you did on that particular passage, and then you're told that you're going to read another text. And your goal, which you've been told at the beginning, is to get at least three right answers. Okay. So the, the point here is that um, – I'm actually going to go back to this. The point here is that we're trying to get kids to get a measure of how kids are reading with comprehension. These comprehension questions were designed to be very um, easy for them to, to, to uh, respond to. We're trying to get an indication of the flow of students' reading. Okay, so how did students do on this? And this is based on 
um, I think about seven or 8,000 students in, in pilot studies, and it's been done with grades 4 through 8. What we see is one group. So these are the kids that we saw on the national assessment, possibly. Um, I mean, we haven't given them the national assessment and then this. But what we see is about 41% of the students, 33%, um, are reading moderately to fast with accurate comprehension. And again, we're not talking here today about getting certain rates. This isn't um, Evelyn Wood's speed reading. But we want to talk about what happens when you aren't showing comprehension. Is that a little worry if you're reading really slowly with accurate comprehension? Possibly not. <clears throat> there are lots of differences in how kids read. But that might be something to think about. Now you've got the middle group. And what you've got here are students who are moderately comprehending. Keep remembering this was designed so that kids pretty much got about you know, 90%, and these kids haven't. So we actually take, um, just like you do with oral reading fluency, um, you take um, the median score. Okay? So here we have um, how the kids in the middle are doing. We've got some that are slow, some that are moderate, some that are fast. Most of them are pretty moderate with moderate comprehension. It'd be nice to get that a little bit better, but a group that we really have to be concerned about are the kids on the left. These kids have slow to moderate comprehension, excuse me, rate and poor comprehension, and we got a robust 5% that have fast rates and very poor comprehension. Okay, and I'm going to suggest that it's these two groups, the kids who depend on schools to become liter literate, that I want to talk about today. What do we do about this? I mean, one of the things that um, a company like Pearson is really concerned about is how to get a more valid measure of the kids on the left-hand side, especially the ones in that bottom left-hand corner who are reading so quickly. And we, in fact, have done some additional research to show that there's a pretty consistent pattern here. So in another study with some colleagues um, at the University of Nebraska, what we looked at is how students did when they had a chunk of text and some questions. And at what point did kids actually stop doing really concerted reading, really sustained reading? What we found is that the kids in the bottom quartile actually did relatively well in their comprehension of the very first passage. The kids in the second from the bottom um, quartile followed the same pattern with the second chunk of text. But once these kids got past those chunks of text, their rates speeded up. It was as if they were saying, you know, I gave it the office. I've done enough now. Okay? And then the kids in the top half actually kept a pretty consistent rate as they read the next three chunks of text. So what I'm suggesting here is we're seeing a group of kids who are engaged in when they're left on their own, as it is on these digital tasks. And I did say, didn't I, that these were all digital. Um, kids are doing this on the computer. And I don't want you to make um, conclusions based on your, on your state test because we haven't looked at those. We've been looking at these specific silent reading with comprehension measures. But one of the things that we did was to better understand those kids in the bottom quartile. We actually did some testing to find a group of kids who were participating in this fast reading, low comprehension, or slow reading, low comprehension. Both of these groups are in here. And here's what we found. We asked the students to read the same kinds of text in an online and a paper and pencil situation. And in the paper and pencil situation, there was a lot more supervision. Some adult was actually sitting right there with the kids wasn't that there wasn't supervision when they were working on the computer, but it wasn't one-to-one. -one. What we actually found in this study was that students' reading rates went down considerably. And look at the right <coughs> on the comprehension. It turned out that rather than having about 78% comprehension, as a group, 
these students got 95% comprehension. So our point here is that these students could read, had the ability to read when they were in a supervised situation, just like they are in the oral reading fluency, right? Because in oral reading fluency, <clears throat> you can't all of a sudden decide not to keep reading the words and just jumping ahead to the bottom of the text. So based on these data, I'm going to suggest that attention to how kids read silently, opportunities to read silently, and support for increasing your ability to stick with a task, including knowing that you can do this task, are among the most important things we can be doing with kids starting in the middle of second grade and on. A lot of our kids really haven't been taught to work in an extended period of time with particular kinds of scaffolds, something that we might call scaffolded silent reading, which is a term Ray Rutzel has, has coined. Okay, so let me give you a couple of actions for dealing with a situation. And I think I'm going to try and go back. I hope I don't make you a little ill here. I want to come back to these two uh, groups in brighter pink. I'm saying we've got a large portion of the population that isn't doing a particularly good job, even in short tasks, of monitoring their comprehension and reading silently. So how can we alleviate the situation? I'm going to suggest that the first thing, and a very critical thing, is that we ensure that our students have increased responsibility for instructional texts. Now, I don't want you to misinterpret this. I'm not saying that teachers shouldn't be reading aloud high quality literature to students, or that students shouldn't be listening to great narrators read texts. I personally spend a lot of time listening to great narrators reading interesting texts when I do other kinds of things in my life. But I am suggesting that there's an element that I think has been slipping away from us in American classrooms called responsible reading when the students are responsible for instructional texts. And I'm talking about the text that your school, your district, your state has purchased to help increase students' capacity as readers. So I'm not talking about the books that the teacher might read as read-alouds. I'm not talking about books for independent reading, which is a really critical thing to be happening. I'm talking about part of the school day when kids are responsible for their own reading of text. And what I'm going to show you is that it appears that what's happened in American classrooms is that the time spent reading has actually, the time devoted to reading has actually increased. But what we're seeing is that the time spent reading, even though the amount of the school day devoted to reading has increased, we're actually seeing less time kids spend reading. Now, in the last decade or so, when there have been lots of policy changes, some of these large-scale assessments of what kids are actually spending their time in classrooms haven't been happening. But one that was done fairly comprehensive study shows that this has actually even been um, seeping up, if things can seep up, into the middle and high schools. So what um, this group at the University of Texas did is they spent time observing in English language arts and social studies classrooms in grades 7 to 12. And they actually found that in a regular classroom period, a fair amount of time was devoted to reading. But here's what they found. Of the 8.25 minutes of reading, 80% of it was spent with somebody else being responsible for the reading. Okay? So in terms of students actually doing the reading, it was a very small slice of the time. 
And I'm going to suggest that, and I'm not saying this needs to be hours and hours, the amount that we're talking about is about, um, in, in these studies that I just showed you, the amount that students have been reading has been about 15, per, uh, 15 minutes in a school day, and that seems to have decreased. Okay, so when we look at uh, one study that was done, it actually showed that seven minutes of increased responsible reading time in classrooms distinguished distinguished students who were in classrooms with high levels of comprehension from those in classrooms with lower levels of comprehension. So the target that I'm going for is about 20 minutes a day of responsible reading. And by responsible reading, I'm saying that it's students whose eyes are on the text and are responsible for constructing the meaning that the message has. Some of you, this actually goes over a lot better when I'm talking to uh, people in person, but some of you have heard me say that I've actually been outsourcing my exercise regime, you know, like where I pay somebody to do my exercise for me. That's supposed to be uh, a joke, which is kind of hard to do in a webinar when you're just talking to yourself. But the point that I'm making is that when teachers do the reading for students, we can expect that teachers are going to get better at reading, at least in terms of their expression and so on. But what we're designing our reading for is for students to be doing the reading. Now I can hear you asking, but you know, what if they can't read? Well, I showed you at the beginning that most kids have, except for some kids in the bottom, probably 2 to 3 percent. Most students, and even those students at the bottom 2 or 3 percent, are reading the majority of the words in text, not at the level of 90 or 95 percent accuracy, but about 82 to 87 percent. But what we're not seeing is students actually being responsible for some of this reading. And I'm going to propose that um, as we've added to reading research, we've added more and more and more activities related to reading, more and more strategies that teachers feel they need to teach and talk about with students. I um, haven't included that slide here, but um, I've done some measurement of how big teachers' guides are for reading programs. And what I found is that the teachers' guides from 1960, so when we, um, that initial study of students' reading rates with comprehension was done, to the mid-2000s, the teachers' manuals has actually increased by a, by a measure of 10% excuse me, 10 times. So there's 10 times more material things you're supposed to do. And what I suggest is we have to return to the kids actually need to do the reading. And many kids are having putting it off to others. And when you don't take risks as a reader, it becomes really, really difficult at some point to start doing it on your own. Okay, so my first point is we've got to increase student responsibility for reading. And I get that this doesn't happen in a day. Okay, so the next point is that we need to increase student stamina as readers. Part of this is understanding that they can read a lot of most of the words in the text. But another thing is helping them to chunk the text and to increase the amount that you're running. Uh, running, I'm um, actually reading, but I'm using running as a metaphor here. You don't start training by running a complete marathon. You're going to chunk it up. And similarly, I'm suggesting from the get-go, even with young readers, we need to give them stuff in chunks, make them responsible for it, and then follow through that in fact they've done that. One of the things that I've been involved with is writing series of texts that are in sections. Okay? So this particular session, uh, sec, um, 
set of texts is on how Independence Day is celebrated in different countries. There's also a text on the Philippines, um, one on Mexico, and of course um, and on, on the United States as well. But what we want to be doing is giving kids a reason to read. Hopefully they're establishing what it is they want to learn to read as they're moving through. But we want to give them these chunks, and we want to increase the size of the chunk. Okay, so as the school year goes on, we're increasing how much you're reading. Okay, so we want purpose-setting questions, giving students responsibility for the first read. Then we do some verification. You know, we don't have to talk about everything to the same extent. Some texts like these have some information that you might want to record. They aren't going to require the kind of conversations you might have with a text like Tuck Up Everlasting. But we want kids to be taking the responsibility, and if they discovered a lot of words that they don't know, didn't know in the text, actually giving them the opportunity to raise those words and to talk about it. A second part of the stamina is actually having, from about the middle of second grade, students being very cognizant of the amount that they're reading and of their attention and the length of time that they read. So I'm suggesting that um, students are establishing some baseline, they're setting some goals, and here's what's also important. They're also keeping a record of what they've read. Keeping a record of what you've read. You know, we read not just because it's a good thing to do. We keep a record because we learn things from text. Texts are where we learn about the human condition. Texts are where we get information about how different countries celebrate um, independence, their independence, um, their national spirit, and so on. So keeping a record, knowledge logs, record logs, whatever you call them, are really an important part of knowing why I want to read, why it's important to read. That's a really critical part of this notion of developing great silent reading strategies. The first, third action I'm going to describe today is immersing students in magazine articles. Now this could be a whole webinar on its own, but the thing about magazine articles is it turns out that what you know is a strong influence on what you comprehend, and it's not about the teacher telling you what you should know before you read something. It's about being able to access text so that I can learn things and improve and read new things. Now one of the wonderful things about a magazine article, and at Text Project, which is my not-for-profit, we have about, a, well, actually about 150 now, articles written so that students have experience with the highest frequency words in written English. And I'm not just talking about the and is and of. And I'm sorry this looks a little strange. I've, um, I'm a Mac user and this is on a different platform. But my point is that the thing about a magazine article is for kids who haven't read a lot, it's there and it looks doable. Furthermore, in a magazine article, the writer is actually helping you understand the things you need to know about this topic. So unlike a novel, you know, like the Birch Bark House or M.C. Higgins the Great, the author is actually making assumptions in those narratives about things you know. In these articles, you're actually building viable and actually seeable bodies of knowledge, things you can record in your knowledge journal. Okay, so um, one of the things, if you do use magazine articles, and there are a lot of them coming out now electronically, be certain that you don't use programs where the challenged readers get substantially shorter text. You'd actually expect challenged readers to get text that are a little bit longer, because if you're changing some of the ideas to make them more accessible, it actually takes more words. So I'm cautioning you about programs like Newzella 
or Achieve 3000, if you use programs like that, hit for the middle text so that kids can talk about the text with each other. And the kids who are really needing a lot of grist in learning to read actually get the amount of experience they need to get good at it. But at Text Project, we've provided these texts that you can project, you can make copies um, on a lot of different topics. They have to do with human interest, as this topic does. They have to do with the arts. They have to do with science, social studies, and so on. Okay. So what I'm suggesting is a magazine article like this is something that is accessible. And what I'm suggesting to American teachers is this is something that should be happening at least one of these a day not my particular articles, but I'm just saying you should be reading a magazine article and looking for ways to connect that information as well. One of the best sources that I know of for free magazine articles is readworks.org. And what my colleagues there have been doing is they've been curating sets of articles, for example, on architecture, which is a really important uh, topic that's often assumed in stories where you talk about what, how the setting affects readers and so on. So um, here are some um, examples of what I'm describing as curated. And I hope you've gotten the, um, the email for that, uh, readworks.org. They've got about 3,000 free articles at lots of different levels. And they also have something called Step Reads, which has the same article in increasingly more accessible um, levels of text. So what have I talked about today? I started out by describing um, the fact that we've got kids who can read, but aren't reading at the levels that we like for them to be reading at. Then I described um, evidence for, from, um, for example, Dibbles that looks at um, what it is that kids can do. I looked at um, the silent reading fluency measure that is providing you information about how kids are comprehending while they're reading silently. And then I looked at three actions. I said the first one was making kids responsible for reading. A second action um, is I'm sorry, there's some, some noise going on in my environment here, and so I'm, I've just been distracted a little bit. So I'm actually going to quickly go back and, oh yeah, we talked about the development of stamina. And then finally, we talked about having students read magazine articles. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions, and I'm going to um, welcome you to visit textproject.org if you want classroom materials. They're right here um, under that uh, topic, um, that title of classroom materials. There are materials for parents and tutors, including some text called Beginning Reads. But what I've been suggesting today is that one of the biggest challenges that I think we face in American education is our commitment to having kids take responsibility for the text. And some of that's going to be really hard to work through because some kids, once they've stopped having responsibility, don't want to take it. Um, but that is the challenge, and I'm saying that the silent reading fluency with comprehension measure is just an outstanding one that our colleagues at Ames Webb Pearson have developed. So um, Sherry, I don't know, um, are there some questions here that, um, that we can take a look at? Well, there aren't any questions as of yet. Should we give people a chance to, um, um, to ask those? And I'm going to just pop out and ask the noise maker in my household to hold off for a little bit, okay? So just okay. give me one minute. Have any questions? Chat box, and Dr. Hebert will answer them. Okay, I'm back. And we've gotten a question. Okay. I'm, inter I'm interested in the study of fluency and comprehension in paper and online. So should we as teachers 
offer students two different formats of reading uh, formats of reading assessments so that they could reach their best comprehension. So the question has to do with reading whether because we had to have this finding, right? That um, and I can go back to that whether we have this finding that some kids aren't doing particularly well when they're left on their own, whether then we should have them always work in that mode. And I'm actually going to suggest that developing stamina in different contexts is absolutely essential. Learning how to monitor myself, whether it's on paper. See, I think if we'd done this, this um, same study with large groups of kids working on paper, they would have done the same thing. I don't think it's the paper or the online. I think it's your ability to monitor yourself. Now, we haven't done that study, but I don't want the takeaway here to be that if it was only on paper, things would be fine. We don't know that. You know, if you're in a large group, I think one of the issues we uh, I've actually been arguing, right, that w one of the issues that we see on the national assessment is that kids aren't. So let's go back to that passage. I think we've got lots of kids that stop reading. On um, I think that's going to be a little too hard for me to get back there, but you remember it was a 900 word passage, and I think it's going to be far too difficult uh, for I think a lot of kids just stop reading. And so what I'm actually suggesting here is it's not the format, but it's the monitoring and action. That when I'm left on my own, I think also on paper and pencil when I'm in a large group, that's what the NAEP is like. We see that on um, some of the state assessments. Kids aren't doing the reading. And when the texts get long, they'll cut themselves off after a certain part, and that makes it impossible to do the comprehension. How do you help ESOL students improve their comprehension? Well, I mean, for um, those of us who live in places like California, which is um, where I live, the issues of supporting kids who are speakers of other languages is the center of much of what we're doing. And I think that the things that I was talking about with, and I'm jumping around here to the slides, but when you look at my actions, I think these actions are just as applicable. But I think we have to ensure that the texts that the students have to be responsible for are ones that they can actually access. Now from my work, I really emphasize the use of informational texts. So the short texts that I was showing you, for example, on Canadian and Mexican independence, are a great example of um, you know, short chunks of text and you know, the, the FYIs, the magazine articles that I was showing you, those are texts that have been written to really emphasize the words in English that account for the greatest part of the English vocabulary. So both in um, the text that I was showing you, I've got to stop jumping around like this. I'm probably making some of you sick. But in the text that I was showing you here, which is from something called Quick Reads. And the um, FYIs that I showed you later, like on the bird's nest and the uh, passage about the young girl in, in um, Africa, um, these passages have been written along a continuum to have ever increasing amounts of, um, of words that account for the largest percentage of the words in, in written English. So there are 2,500 morphological families that account for about 90 to 95 percent of the words students read at different grade levels. And you can actually find texts that help move kids up that staircase of accessible text. 
and I'm saying that's what's really critical. I think information is the most critical base to start because there's a lot of information that's needed and that they might not know. And furthermore, informational text doesn't make some of the demands on inferencing and prior knowledge that stories do. Okay, there are, authors always assume a lot on the part of readers. But in the case of stories, a lot more assumptions are made than is the case in informational text. So my suggestion is accessible text, having kids be responsible. They've got to start taking responsibility for their own reading, and they want to. And um, they also need to be acquiring um, you know, background knowledge. And, and I'm suggesting that these forms of text that actually build kids' vocabularies is really an important thing. Any other questions? What are your Oh, yes, what are your thoughts regarding the impact of video games, et cetera, and the capacity of students to monitor attention and stay focused? So video games, well, it, it turns out, I mean, they have just an amazing um, amount of capacity to stay focused on a video game, don't they? Um, am I thinking that the... Um, intensity of interest in certain things like video games and then the seeming disinterested in, in things like, um, like reading books um, could be related. I'm, I, I'm not an expert on that, but I think that um, we do have kids who have a lot of different choices in their lives, and we also have kids who um, have fairly poor executive monitoring abilities that they jump around. Um, I don't think it's only kids that do that. I think I see a lot more jumping around in terms of um, my own ways of working than I did probably about 20 years ago. So is this something that um, is going to be an issue for us as we move forward? I think it is. I think this is, that's why I've been saying this is I think the most important thing that we can do the chunking and the setting goals. Um, but I also think a really critical component of this is ensuring that we have text that is critically engaging, that kids are seeing what they're learning, which is why I'm really pushing for these knowledge logs. Having the opportunity to keep documenting that I, I'm learning interesting things, and these things can make a difference in who I become and in, in what I do. And I think that those are some of the ways in which we can support our students. Not, not teaching them you know, 15 strategies for monitoring yourselves. Um, the research is basically showing that you know, what you want is for kids to know that they need to monitor, they need to attend. And one of the ways that you do that is do some brief follow-ups after they've read a chunk of text like this one. It doesn't mean that you have to go on and on and on and on in terms of you know discussing it and how is Canada different than the United States and why are they different and blah blah blah. It's just you know there's a different tradition here and what is that in terms of of Canada Day. So some um, setting purpose and monitoring and engaging material. I think all of those are are critical things. If there is a student who is just sitting instead of reading as they were told to do, how would you address this so that the students are really actively, silently reading? So how do I foster active, responsible reading? One of the things that I think hasn't been an underlying current in our literacy programs is the fact that we read so that we can learn interesting things. And I think students have to have some sense of themselves as agents, agency, as readers, and get to have some choice as to what it is they're reading. So I think that's part of it, that there needs to be not all the time, but within even um, this text that I'm showing you on celebrating independence, 
I think it could be much more useful to take the five texts on this topic and have different kids in the classroom read them and then have a reason to talk about them. Okay? So there needs to be some sense that I'm actually doing this to contribute to something. I think the knowledge logs are important as a way to see what it is that I'm learning. And I think having some um, autonomy at different points and saying, I really want to get good at that. And then having some recognition that I really got good at that. I was talking to a group of, of teachers um, last week um, in New York about the kind of reading programs that they have in the summer. And one of the schools is just brilliant in terms of the follow-up that they have, the times of celebration of what is it that I learned during the summer, not just like what I did on my summer vacation, but I'm meaning what topic did I get good at? And having a time of recognition. And I think those are important things to do. I mean, obviously there are some kids that are going to act like they're bored all the time. But I think in every human being there are things we're interested in. And we've never lived in a time where we have so much knowledge available to us and such easy access to it. You know, you're not depending on having an encyclopedia in your house. On a mobile, you can find out a lot of interesting things. And I think uncovering this incredibly exciting world for students and recognize, recognizing what it is that they're good at and what they've learned through text is really important. And like I said, varying tasks, like this business of chunking text, have different kids in a classroom read the different texts. When I showed you the ReadWorks text on the different topics, every kid can have, you know, uh, kids can be in small groups that read different texts. And so they actually bring something valid to the other kids. I have something I need to share. I, it's worth it. You know, I'm not just being asked to sit there and read on my own and then do whatever I want with it. I'm actually contributing something here to the whole group. So I think that can, those are some ideas. Obviously, these are things that um, are going to be our conversations as educators over the next decades. We're going to really um, need to do incredible amounts of studying, sharing with each other what it is that's working. Um, but from the research, these ideas of kids developing bodies of their own knowledge, having reasons to read so that they can actually share them in the community, those are important ideas. Would you recommend an oral follow-up on the comprehension component or a written follow-up or perhaps a combination of the two? So one of the questions, and I'm assuming with um, an oral follow-up, it's, it's you know that you would read, read the text. Um, in, in this particular um, um, example that I'm showing um, with, with Canada Day, what I would really want to see, yeah, I mean, I, I've been talking about knowledge journals. I mean, we have to also um, monitor ourselves in terms of how much we ask students right, to write so that it isn't like every time I read something I have to write about it. But I think that that idea that in some places was poorly executed and was sometimes incomprehensible, at least to me, of close reading, what I've come to is that it's critical to have a chance to focus on a key idea after I've read something. And that's when close reading, and that can involve me reading aloud the sentence that tells you the most important idea here, or a takeaway that I'd like the other students in the class to remember. Um, you know, This is a text that I read about Canada. I think a text that the, the one idea that you um, really want to see is uh, know about is that you know Canada was a model for other countries to become independent and that would be in the last sentence since then more than 50 other uh, former colonies have gained their independence from Great Britain in a similar way so rereading something that's really important I think is a really important thing to do um, you know taking notes or writing some things but again, judiciously used. 
and varying the pattern. That is one of the things that uh, Ray Rutzel found in his study of sustained silent reading, uh, or excuse me, scaffolded silent reading, is that it was really useful to mix things up when you use the same format over and over again. No matter how good it was, it became a little tedious. So I think changing some things, but I think following up by commenting on something or observing something or you know, a really critical word that I want to take away from this text um, is, is an important thing to do. Sherry, any other feel, questions? Yes. Do you feel that a fluency center or station is effective in increasing fluency? Do you feel that they focus too much on speed rather than comprehension? So I want to distinguish here. So the question is about fluency. And I want to distinguish between oral fluency and silent fluency. And one of the things that I haven't talked about today is the intent to increase your rate of silent reading fluency. There are some programs that do it. I think the jury is out in terms of efficacy. I mean, is it just better to do more reading um, than to actually I'm, – I'm not into um, – looking at silent reading rates as, as uh, certain kinds of requirements. So I, I think that having reasons to read, so I'm going to talk first about silent reading fluency, and then I'm going to move to oral reading fluency. So in terms of silent reading fluency, I mean, I think it's, it's important for kids to have some consciousness about the silent reading rate. I think that um, you know, through an assessment like I showed you today, I think there can be more awareness of that, and I think that can be important. Um, but I'm, I don't want people to have the takeaway either that you should <laughs> be reading, uh, some kids only should read in paper, and that you have to increase rate. Those are two ideas I don't want you to, to walk away with today. I'm just saying we have to understand the rate, and I think there's a lot more we have to understand before we say this isn't a very functional rate or whatever. As you saw, there were some really good readers who were reading very slowly. And I know some very good readers who read slowly, um, some very scientific people who read very slowly. So it's not about the rate in silent reading, but I think it is increasing the amount of silent reading that's important there. So if there was a station where kids were, you know, a knowledge station where I'm seeing how much text I can read on a particular topic, that would be kind of an interesting station. In terms of silent reading fluency, um, <clears throat> I think we've spent a lot of time, I mean, I think the work of Jay Samuels and LeBurge um, from the 70s shows that you know, automaticity is important. But I think we've spent a lot of time focusing on particular numbers as oral reading fluency. And we've, especially with English language learners, we've um, emphasized the decoding and the speed to the detriment of what did I learn? What, what does this mean? Why did I read it? And I think that has to start really, really early. Um, and again, I mean, in my work with um, quick reads, which go down to um, end of first grade, um, you know, my work with the beginning reads, which are a free product at Text Project, I emphasize informational text. And I think for English language learners and kids uh, from high poverty communities, it's important to actually say, wow, I read this to learn new things. And the new things aren't you know, complicated. They have to do with the difference. You know, here are some different colors of trucks. And you know, why are school buses yellow? <clears throat> it actually turns out people see yellow more easily than other colors, and so it makes it safe. But um, you know, my emphasis on uh, a a fluency station would be on what I'm learning and what I'm remembering. And um, you know, I think that with younger readers, I mean, mostly as a second grade teacher, when I asked, had silent reading time, you know, sustained silent reading, it was a very noisy part of the day. Um, kids read orally, and that's, that's one of the transitions, that's one of the processes why, whereby they become better readers. But I think we've erred in the um, direction of emphasizing the speed and not thinking about what it was that you learned from it. And from my perspective, any fluency activity 
should be followed up with, and now what's important to remember? What did you learn from this? Um, so that that's, I think, where we've really fallen down. Where you know we love numbers um, as as educators and as people. Um, you know, I love my Fitbit numbers, and sometimes we can become obsessed with those. <clears throat> but the point isn't that you know. Did you um, read in you know so and so many words per minute? Um, but in fact, what was it that you learned from that text, and why is that important? So, I, and I'm not saying you know disregarding fluency practice. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying. Uh, what is it that you put in the foreground and what goes in the background? So Sherry, is there another question? I think we've got time for one more, and then it looks to me like we're almost at the top of the hour. Do you have any specific, specific strategies for responsible reading besides teachers giving more class time? Well, two of the strategies that I also added were um, that you do a lot of chunking of text. And added to that, I'm going to return to that slide, which I think is really critical, is that students set some goals for themselves. You know, how long do I typically read? And then, you know, how long did I read? What was my longest period of reading? And I think you can do some gamifying of that. Kids like to, you know, do some gamifying, but did I see any kind of improvement? and how much I read this week, but also in the longest period in, our, in which I read in a sustained fashion. And I'm coming back here to that idea that we always, always keep remembering that what's in the foreground for me always is what is it that I learned from doing this. Okay, so those are two ideas. And then the other thing that I said was I think that um, the use of magazines and the fact that I can sustain my attention through that. You know, could I now read two magazines and com articles and compare them? That's another strategy that could help get kids to increase their stamina. By the way, you know what I didn't do today? And this is a good way to end. I'm sorry. I have a book called Teaching Stamina and Silent Reading. It's a set of, of articles that are combined. Um, but it's a free PDF at Text Project. Um, you can also get uh, get it for free at smashbooks.com. And you know, to get publici uh, publicity on a book at Amazon, you actually have to charge 99 cents. You don't have to do that. I'm just saying there are places to get this book for free. But that gives you some more thinking. And I'm going to be doing additional writing on this topic. You can count on that over the next um, year. And I really appreciate all of you listening in today. Uh, what I've um, wanted to communicate today is that there's um, a new kid on the block, and that is this new um, silent reading fluency with comprehension measure that I think gives you really important information and also helps you and your students focus on a dimension that's often been overlooked in classrooms. So for your time and your attention today, thank you so very, very, very much. Great questions, and I hope that <clears throat> you've gotten something to think about. You can also send a question to textproject.org um, if you have some additional questions to ask. So thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Ebert, for a, a great presentation. And that does conclude our webinar.